And hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm going to be your host, and I'm here today with my guest, uh, Venkat. And I'm Venkat. I'm your host, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa, today. And also, since we're doing the letter C, I am eating a cookie. So I've decided from now on in oh, some shows, I'll be trying to I eat had some food. chips. <laughs> chips, cookies, yeah. Alphabetic team food. Yeah. All right. So what are we talking about besides cookies? Uh, let's see. So today on our list of things to talk about, we have cartoons, contagion, uh, which coronavirus or COVID is a subcategory of, and then we also have cleaning, as in cleaning your house. Um, do you want to go ahead and start in on the cartoon one? I'm not really sure. So you're, So I guess maybe I should preface this cartoon one with like, I'm not, I don't watch a whole lot of cartoons. Um, I don't think I've ever watched a lot of cartoons, but you seem to be a really big cartoon fan. Yeah. It's almost like my main um, way to track the zeitgeist and how culture was evolving. Like uh, when I first landed in the U.S. in 97, The Simpsons was kind of the uh, the primary cultural document of um, the U.S., I would say. Like it was... Between that and Seinfeld, I would say, and Seinfeld was more kind of a blue state, New York, uh, California kind of thing. So I would say Simpsons was pretty much the, I don't know, the way you understood America. And the first year I lived with a couple of other Indian grad students in um, near the engineering campus. But in the second year of uh, living in the U.S., I moved down to what was uh, Central Campus in Ann Arbor. And I moved in with a bunch of Americans and they used to watch the Simpsons religiously every day, like all the reruns. So this was before streaming. So mm-hmm. that was my immersive education into American culture, just watching like two to three hours of Simpsons reruns every day for several years. And then it became, of course, um, South Park. Uh, Futurama I discovered late, but it's now my favorite. I've rewatched the whole of Futurama like four times. And uh, mm-hmm. of course, Rick and Morty is kind of the state of the art in... Uh, uh, cartoon show storytelling so or zeitgeist tracking so that those are my kind of four if i had to make up sort of a global slash american canon it would be the sequence of four shows simpsons south park futurama rick and morty have you watched any of how them? do you what have you watched any of them i'm sorry no you haven't watched any of them oh my god <laughs> I really don't like cartoons, like animated cartoons. Just, I can't. So what have you watched? Well, what, what developed your dislike for animated cartoons? It's not even a, um, I don't know if it's anything that I saw that necessarily like turned me off of them so much as just the format of like watching drawings move. I just, I found it really hard <laughs> to get involved in. Um, I will say I did watch BoJack Horseman. And that's probably the only um, only cartoon I've ever watched. I don't even think I've seen the last, the most recent season that they released. I think I saw like four or five seasons of it. Um, um, interesting. But I am the curious. only one I don't like, like BoJack Horseman. Like I can tolerate all of them. Like even you know, Family Guy, American Dad. They're like really awful, like second rate shows of the last decade. But BoJack Horseman, even mm. though it's, everybody seems to love it. It's the one I really can't stand. <laughs> it's kind of odd. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting. So, okay, so how do you, I guess to me, so you listed off like four shows, um, The Simpsons, Rick and Morty, Futurama, and there's one more, South Park. Um, how do you, why those four, like, I mean, there's a lot of other shoes, like American Dad or I don't even know what else there is, but there's like other yeah, stuff. Family Guy is the big one. Yeah. yeah. Why do those four make it on your list of like canon and everything else like not? Like what's the differentiator? There? So one thing uh, I would say it's not just me. It's like basically most of cartoon watching America, those four would probably be up there. Futurama might be a little arguable, but the other three, Simpsons and South Park, definitely. Rick and Morty, I think is um, ahead by like a nose and the second group watches Bojack Horseman. So it's like, it's like for several, for a decade or two, it was like 
there was only Coca-Cola and then Pepsi came on the scene. I think that's where we are in the evolution of comic uh, shows. Like uh, now there's a Pepsi on the sh- uh, scene. And I think you can divide the world into people who like Rick and Morty versus people who like Bojack Horseman. And of course, there's people who like both or kind of are indifferent towards both. But I think it's, it says something. It's like the Mac versus PC of cartoon shows right now, I think. Uh, but, but why those four? Hmm. Uh, I would say this is going to be very sort of, um, I guess, uh, there's an element of like gendered misogyny to all these shows in the sense that they all feature a kind of like strong male lead who's kind of like an asshole. And mm-hmm. I think there's, uh, so uh, with uh, The Simpsons, Bart was a bratty little kid who was the original lead, but then it started focusing on Homer. Homer is just this like uh, completely oblivious um, uh, he's a he's a good-hearted but stupid guy who kind of like coasts through oblivious of like how easy life is for him and kind of gets out of all scrapes. Mm-hmm. South Park, I think, became a little bit more self-aware where uh, uh, Eric Cartman is sort of like, um, I don't know, portrayed as like lacking self-awareness and everybody hates him for it. But at some point, interestingly, I think in the last few years, South Park kind of like flipped and started focusing more on Stan's dad, Randy, who's much more like a uh, um, uh, Homer Simpson kind of character. So again, it's kind of like, it's almost like that's Hmm. the natural terminal point of all these shows. They end up on focusing on a guy like that. What was the third one? Futurama is actually interesting. Futurama has strong female leads. It's it's a sort of classic, uh, uh, you know the Italian uh, Commedia dell'art, the classic Italian comedy with uh, Harlequin. Uh, uh, it's called the Harlequinade. So the classic six comic characters of Italian comedy. So Futurama is kind of like based on that. So there's the old man, lecherous old man, the young couple in love, the strong sort of uh, uh, angry woman, then the stupid guy. So it has like the stock comedy characters of like classic Italian comedy. So Mm -hmm. I would say Futurama is the most sort of uh, evolved of the shows and uh, Matt Grenig's third show, which is not very popular, actually features a female lead. It's the medieval show. So it's uh, set in medieval times and it's like a female version of Fry from Futurama. And what is the last one? Yeah, Rick and Morty is uh, interesting. Uh, So if you didn't kind of, catch that it's kind of a riff on um, the old, uh, uh, what's its um, name, the Back to the Future show. Uh, instead of Doc and Mort, uh, Marty, it's uh, Rick and uh, Marty. And the characters are kind of like uh, flipped versions of that, where the teenage boy is like a complete dweeb and the uh, crazy mad scientist uncle is like a nihilistic, uh, problematic character. <laughs> So anyway, so th- th- that's, uh, I, I think that's kind of why they play such a strong role in capturing the imagination because uh, it is a patriarchal society and a patriarchal viewpoint character who's fundamentally mm-hmm. sympathetic, but mm-hmm. also an asshole. is kind of a, a very, I, I don't know, a solid perspective as in it may, you may not agree with that character or their way of viewing the world, but the world is the way they view it to a large extent. So it's a very powerful storytelling viewpoint. And I think that's why these shows are like, I don't know, so popular. But uh, you're right. I, this is kind of universal. I think women in general don't like any of these animated shows as much as guys do. And my wife doesn't like them. And we kind of have to trade off TV time for she wants to watch her shows and I have to watch my animated shows. Anyway, that's my long riff on cartoons. Yeah, I kind of, I mean, it is, I think you kind of get at something interesting though that's like, um, I think you kind of, find in a lot of literature in terms of the pieces of art that speak to you the most tend to be ones that uh, represent um, roles that you understand or that you see or that like maybe you don't see yourself in but at least like make some sort of like sense to you um yeah so like so what do you what, what do you watch like it doesn't have to be cartoons but what sh- kind of shows do you watch what's your canon of shows of the over the last decades say? yeah stuff that i've decades, seen say. like a lot of um 
Well, let's see. I got like so in college, just like a decade ago now. I was really into Lost, and I had like there were three shows I was really into. Um, I really liked House MD, like the Doctor Show. I really liked um, cause Hugh Laurie is just great uh, as an actor. Like just like I don't know, love watching him. Um, and then Lost was like the big overarching one, and then I was also watching Heroes, um, which. There's a writer's strike in the middle of the third season of Heroes, and the whole thing kind of jumped the shark or whatever, and I never really got back on after the writer's strike thing happened, which was actually kind of an interesting thing to happen. Um, I'm trying to think through things I've, like, seen all of or, like, been really into. Um, Battlestar Galactica was, like, a big one for me. Um, interesting. I think in the ones you mentioned, we definitely should put Hugh Laurie on our list for H because I'm also a huge fan of Hugh Laurie. Um, and I love um, House. Yeah, House was a, a great show. Uh, but yeah, let's um, save Hugh Laurie for um, an H episode. But the other stuff, it's kind of interesting. I, the team I see there is really large, like bigger than like on some kind of uh, casts. Like Friends had six characters in the 90s. It was a crappy show, but six to me sounds like a, a kind of unit that people can track easily, like, you know, the magic number seven plus or minus two, that classic paper that people can keep seven things in short term memory. So mm -hmm. Friends had six yeah. archetypal characters, Seinfeld had four. So all these shows, mm -hmm. classics from the 90s to early 2000s, they had less than seven or eight. Uh, and I think that's one reason I couldn't get into Lost. It was like simply tracking too many damn characters and things happening to them. But it sounds like that's kind of what I like about it. I loved it. I lo Lost was good. I also, like, I was really disappointed in how it ended. Um, I also got really into Game of Thrones and was also equally disappointed in how it ended. Um, <laughs> I've seen The Wire. I, I like The Wire. I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm kind of like, uh, oh, True Detective. First season of True Detective. But I also really like the actors. I think to me, like, to a certain extent, not always, but a lot of my connection to a TV show develops around like the personas and characters um, and having like live action people as personas is a lot more, I don't know, it's just easier to like latch onto or something. Yeah. And, and I think there's also an element of uh, all the shows you mentioned are dramas. Like even though Hugh Laurie is known as a comic yeah. actor primarily, all your shows are, are dramas and dramas don't translate well into uh, the animated medium. There's a few, I think. Um, uh, are there? Uh, I guess. Uh, oh, I wonder. Schools, I mean, Bojack yeah. is kind of like a drama, right? Oh, there we go. So we write like it the theme. Yeah, Bojack is more drama than comedy. It's, uh, and okay, yeah. So there we go. The, the, and I think that's a gender thing as well. My Everything my wife likes to watch is more drama. Mm -hmm. We share a few comedies uh, that we both like. Uh, but mostly mm -hmm. she likes watching dramas. And so that, that, that might be a thing. Uh, but uh, I be, do yeah. notice that you seem to like shows with lots of people. Like, uh, again, I didn't like Battlestar Galactica that much. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Is that a thing? Like you like tracking a lot of moving parts? I don't, I mean, it's not anything I've ever thought about, but I guess I do enjoy the complexity. Um. <laughs> ah, I, I don't think I've ever tracked a show that had like more than 10 or 15 characters to really keep track of. So that's, huh. I think, a, a big one huh. for me. Yeah, like, you know, so, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, so it's interesting, like, so you said you came to America and you got into like cute cartoons and that was like your entree into like American culture. When I was in Brazil, I used to spend a decent amount of time watching like telenovelas because um, mm -hmm. that was like the thing everyone watched and they had they were dramas they had like a gajillion like the one I watched there were three there were three that came on every night um it was like a comedy one I can't remember what the second one was like the there's like it's like three hours of like tv every, pretty much I want to say every night maybe Sundays they had off but it's six nights a week the same show um and the which I guess is a lot like cartoons huh like most Cartoons are every night. No, that's a, that's a lot of time. No, cartoons on rerun are a lot, every night perhaps, but they are among the most expensive kinds of shows to produce. So they tend to be half an hour per week 
is actually the economics of cartoons are really expensive. Like it costs, I think, um, uh, even the simplest show costs about ten thousand uh, dollars per minute or something like that. It's uh, production costs are really high, but because once you have them, they have I think a lot more rerun potential because you can work with archetypal characters, mm. whereas human actors, they kind of go in and out of style a little bit to some extent. Uh, uh, like, like. Of the, uh, I recently rewatched some of the '90s shows, and the Friends, uh, the Friends is completely awful. It's unwatchable now. Like the characters are obnoxious; you can't stand them. But back then, I watched it, and it didn't bother me. But on the other hand, Seinfeld has aged really well, even though it is perhaps not PC by many standards. It has re- aged really well, and I don't know why that is the case. Maybe the actors were better, or maybe their approach to the characters was better. But there's uh, cartoons. I think fundamentally age better somehow. Yeah, but interesting. Uh, the other element of what you pointed out—the drama versus comedy—that's um, an interesting one. I, I'm, uh, I was thinking when you when we talked about that about uh, this line that uh, life is a comedy to those who think and a tragedy to those who feel. Have you heard that? Uh, no, I haven't heard it. So, do you ha- do you think you have a fundamentally tragic orientation towards life or uh, <laughs> comic orientation? Do you think life is a tragedy? I don't think life is a tragedy. No, I like to think I'm pretty optimistic. Um, definitely well, having a good time. I don't know. Well, drama is not necessarily synonymous with tragedy, but drama has room for tragedy in a way. Comedy kind of hides it. Like there is always an undercurrent of tragedy in comedy as well, but it kind of ha- hides it a mm. little bit. But, um, Except in BoJack. Yeah, Bojack is like over the top uh, tragic figure like unraveling and like uh, I think what I did like it though it was a little, a little too cringy for me but I did like how well it was done like it's a completely unsympathetic tragic figure unraveling like you cannot like Bojack. No, he's, he's an unlikable. awful character. Yeah. He, but you don't want to look away like it's he's, you know like yeah. I read that about, I was re- recently reading about Alice in Wonderland for other reasons, but um, I think it was Harold Bloom who said that, that every character in Alice in Wonderland is completely awful. And that's true. If you go back and reread everybody from Alice herself to, you know, all the weird characters mm-hmm. in Wonderland, they're all completely awful. And I think we like that. They're all flawed. Yeah. Do you think that the characters in comedy is like the four Cartoons that you mentioned, they're all flawed characters, right? Like, so it's not that comedy... Oh, yeah, they're horrible people. I mean... Right. It's just the way that you treat them. I think they're more identifiable and they kind of give you permission to identify with the, uh, I don't know, jerk side of yourself. And in each of these shows, by the way, there is a really sort of nice character who's played for laughs. So in The Simpsons, it was the neighbor, Ned, who's always like the do-gooder Christian who's like trying to do good to everybody. And he's the butt of all the jokes. In South Park, it's Butters, who's the kid who always like, you know, does what his parents tell him and is like completely good natured. He's the butt of all the jokes. In Futurama, it's Leela, who's like, uh, oh, Simpsons also had uh, Lisa Simpson. Uh, In Futurama, it's um, Leela. In uh, Rick and Morty is interesting. They don't actually have a nice character. There isn't a single sort of um, nice character even played for laughs. Uh, huh. Yeah, so the, these are all terrible people. Uh, all right, speaking of tragedy, like, coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, slowly unfolding, at least here, I think, um, here being the United States. Yeah. So, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, How's Texas? I wouldn't know. Uh, and I say that because I haven't really left my house. So it's hard to like have, I think this is the thing about being in quarantine, right? Or like self-isolation slash whatever you want to call the thing where you stay in your house the whole time and don't go anywhere. Um, like this is the thing Does about Houston it. Houston have stay at home yet? No. No, it doesn't have stay at home yet. Okay. No, not like mandated at any city level. No, that I'm aware of. So here's the thing, Vinkat, like I don't, I haven't really been out in the world in like pretty much two weeks now. I think the last time I like went somewhere was last 
mm, two Wednesdays ago. So like in two days, it'll have been exactly 14 days of inside time. Um, and the thing about it is like, I mean, I go out and go on walks. I have two dogs, so I take them out walking fairly regularly. Like, we go out and look around the neighborhood, um, and I could tell you what's changed about the neighborhood, but, like, I have no idea what the grocery store is like. I don't know what the bar scene is. I mean, I guess I could hop in my car tonight and drive around town and just kind of see what it looks like. Um, I haven't done so that. So you haven't been to the grocery uh, store? So I guess that means you've stocked up already? Like, all right, you're in survival bunker mode. Yeah, I think I got on it like a week before most people did. Um, yeah, I think most of us who are active on Twitter got about a two-week yeah. advantage over normies. Like we, that was very noticeable here in LA because here in LA we are in proper lockdown, so there's actual stay-at-home orders, and they're mm-hmm. talking of like using the police to enforce uh, uh, small groups, and they'll probably shut down the beaches pretty soon. But it, this, I think. Mm-hmm. I've lost track. There's a fairly large outbreak here, um, though not as bad as New York or Washington. Uh, but yeah, we uh, did our little bit of panicking, I think about two weeks before everybody else. We went and got stocked up. And then it was surreal to watch the same stuff that was on Twitter show up on television. And right after the first sort of mayor address or something, suddenly there's a run on the grocery stores and they emptied out. It's kind of back to normal now, but yeah, the, here it's definitely radically shifted. Like Whole Foods, um, they have like uh, social distancing imp- implemented. So you have to stand outside the line, outside the store. They let in only 10 people at a time. They've drawn lines on the pavement that are six feet apart. So you have to stand apart even to get into the store. In the checkout lane, they have like tape on the floor marking six foot separation. So you need that. So yeah, LA is taking it pretty seriously. So, yeah. That's incredible. I mean, so I know there's like a big grocery store here in Texas that's pretty famous called HEB. Um, And I know that, so like, I've, you know, I've been hearing stories from my family members here in town more so than like myself because I don't stuff. But I know like a family member tried to have, this is like my mom, um, had like all of her like a bunch of friends of hers and stuff over for dinner and tried to go to the grocery store to get food for everyone and then couldn't because they had implemented a restriction on how much of like certain items you were allowed to buy so for that was her that was like her first I think real um infrontation with the crisis if that makes sense like prior to that it had just been stuff on the online or whatever but then it's like oh no like now you have to like wait outside the grocery store and they're only letting you have like so many of each item. Um, I think they ran out of toilet paper, um, which was like kind of a <laughs> mini crisis. Like, you know, they're, like throwing hand, hand towels in the trash kind of thing. Like, um, I think they have <laughs> since found toilet paper. Some, but, you know, it was one of those like someone had to like go out of their way to wake up early to go to the Walmart to make sure they were first in line, first in the batch of people that were allowed in the store to get the toilet paper. Um, yeah, it's weird. So, Toilet paper is sort of the uh, cannery in the coal mine for uh, Americans. It's like the shit hit, shit doesn't hit the fan until the toilet paper is off the shelves. Something <laughs> like that. There's a weird joke in there somewhere. Uh, but yeah, yeah uh, there's probably an index you could construct out of that that would at least work in the US. Actually, it would work in Western Europe as well. I've been in contact with like people in Germany who also seem to have toilet paper index crisis. <laughs> Uh, yeah. There's too many easy jokes on toilet paper, so that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I did like that. So, like, so there's two things I want. I want to roll back to um, something you talked about a little bit earlier about, like, how being on Twitter, maybe more something about like Twitter networks that we find ourselves in makes it such that I feel like I get good information much earlier than most people do. Um, like, it's someone was posting a few days ago about how. Um, how the president had been briefed or like the Senate Intel intelligence committee had been briefed. And I want to say early January about the threat. 
Um, yeah, and they sold a bunch of stock. <laughs> yeah, right. That was the context in which we found out about this. We well, found out about when they had been briefed because they then went and sold a bunch of stock, um, which should be illegal. Hopefully, they'll all end up in jail or something. That's not mm-hmm. going to happen. But hope you know, there's like <laughs> we can hope. fear that yeah. they would, or at least they'd have to like give up all the money, like forfeit all that money or something. I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. Anyways. Um, but it was interesting to me to see that like that date versus the date that I found out about coronavirus, right? Um, and it maybe was like a week apart, if that makes sense. Like That's from when? Interesting, yeah. Yeah, so like from, let's huh. say like the president gets it's briefed a week about apart. it. Okay. Yeah, the president and or the intelligence committee of the government gets briefed like maybe let's say first week of January. I definitely saw stuff on Twitter at least by the second week of January. Um, which is kind of incredible. Oh, totally. Uh, I actually went back and looked at my tweets and it's for me, it's kind of interesting because I had a really bad cold slash flu starting on uh, uh, Christmas Eve. And uh, now Same. I'm thinking there's like a 15, 20% chance that was actually um, the coronavirus and maybe it got to the US earlier than we think. But yeah, I was tweeting about having a cold and feeling awful for a couple of weeks. Then my first proper coronavirus tweet I saw it was on January 22nd, where my tweet says something like, oh, great, coronavirus is in the US now. But the way I phrased it made it clear that I had already been tracking it for at least a week or more because it assumed everybody knew what I was talking about. So I think it's the same thing. It's like, uh, I would say mid-January is when uh, I think at least the parts of Twitter you and I are in started tracking um, uh, coronavirus seriously in the U.S. Regularly. Yeah. Yeah. There was like regular updates, right? And like websites popped up with case numbers and stuff like, um, yeah, it's which kind is of kind of fascinating. Like uh, if you look at when the market started reacting in private, it's the same kind of thing, right? The market crash happened only like a week or two ago, but the earliest people who got the signals and started selling early, like um, some of my investors, uh, friends were panicking and selling in December. But uh, the senators mm-hmm. obviously did it in mid-January or whenever. Right. And, uh, yeah, so that's one kind of signal, like when the market starts to move quietly in private. And the same thing, Twitter is like the sort of quiet part of the market, except for narratives. It's like you know, yes. prepping, shopping, all these smaller ways you can invest, even if you're not in the stock market. It's like we were the yeah. senators. <laughs> that's a fun way to think about it. We are the early trading senators of, uh, I don't know, the ghetto layer of response. Yeah, you know, the every man, the mediocre response, you know, the mediocre societies, like, or whatever, yeah. premium mediocre information flows. But um, yeah, which I thought is interesting. Like, I don't know. Our intelligence is good. Um, yeah, kind of- like, uh, I don't know if you, do you follow Danielle Fong on Twitter? Uh, she bought, I think, about $5,000 worth of uh, S&P puts, uh, week mm. or two before the crash and she was like tweeting about it throughout on Twitter like just uh, screenshots of her dashboard and stuff and last I saw she'd made like four and a half million so it was like surreal watching her parlay five thousand dollars into four and a half million and she did this holy cow that's Twitter. incredible yeah oh, and that's incredible there's a bunch of people I think who've made such solid trades but they were doing it openly except before the crash happened, everybody was treating them like crackpots, even though it was publicly on Twitter. Like if you wanted to copy her trade, you could have, right? But not enough people took uh, that seriously, but enough people did. I know several people now who uh, played it right and made a huh. pile of money. But That's yeah, incredible. I think Twitter is uh, definitely strong alpha, early warning on things like this. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because it's like, it kind of gets at like that sort of, um, what do you call it? Like, so high frequency traders, a certain strategy relies on getting information before anyone else does and then trading before they even have the chance to get the information and then respond back. And it, a lot of that is set up mm-hmm. with um, the distance of their computers from the source of the data versus everyone else's. Yep, yep. Um, uh, Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, is, is a really great example of exactly how that works and exactly the people who were involved in setting up infrastructure to like take advantage of um, the information flow, time, de- time delay and information flow, you know, you can make money off of it. Um, 
it's interesting to think and to like, I guess, really see how Twitter is like basically a similar mechanism, just different substrate, so to speak. Yeah, I think um, um, the, the information is there. Actually, you just have yeah, so you have to be plugged in and following the right people and have the right filters to sort of extract the alpha. But if you do, you get so much of a time advantage compared to say high frequency trading, you can have the same amount of leverage with like far less capital outlay. So if you want to take advantage of like a you know, microsecond delay between Chicago and New York to your know, trade in a high frequency way, you probably need to deploy millions to make millions. So you, you have to like put a lot right. of risk for very short periods of time. Whereas if you know how to parse Twitter right and follow the right people, the intelligence you can extract, you can have like the Daniel Fong kind of outcome where a few thousand dollars yeah. can get you a few millions. So it's, it's room for small players, basically. You don't have to be like a highly capitalized big player with like a saw, huge fiber optic line privately leased to the local stock exchange. Um, so yeah, Twitter is yeah. good. I mean, I know there's like... I was like, well, yeah, anyways. Um, uh, but we kind of got distracted from the okay. virus to trading on information about the virus. So we are as bad as people in Washington. We are awful people, just like the people in the cartoons. Yeah. Everybody's awful until they actually get the virus. But uh, yeah, speaking of things more directly relevant to the virus, you did the Twitter thread uh, several weeks back on how to clean your house, right? What was the context of the thread? Like that was before the virus stuff, um, right? So what was that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think like it was just something. So I tend to get really interested in subdomains um, for brief periods of time and then lose interest in them. And cleaning was one of the things that I was very interested in for a very short period of time. Um, specifically, just like how do I clean my house and do it in like a way that is, I don't know. It's just like, how do you, how do you clean your house? I don't know. And so, like, um, I guess I had, like, spent a lot of hours the previous weekend cleaning and was like, oh, this is all kind of interesting stuff. I wonder if I could hit 100 tweets with it. Um, I think I picked it because it was something that, like, I feel like if you – because I feel like you went through and, like, gave people – people who asked for prompts, you gave people prompts. Um, part of your, like, 100 Dead Palooza, um, people would post and then you would be like, okay, like, do the history of, like, the, um, the beard or whatever um, or something. Um, whereas I, mine was self-chosen. I don't think it's one that anyone would have asked me to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, totally. It, it's not the topic I would have picked for you or guessed for you. I would have picked something like, um, I don't know, Bitcoin or David Deutsch or something. So cleaning kind of came out of the, out of left field. So yeah. what? Yeah. So I think in a way it was a little bit of a trollishness of like response to this whole, like, you know, this, like most people are doing things that they're like, definitely. I wouldn't say I'm not an expert in how to clean house, but it definitely felt like kind of this like, eh, well, I'm not necessarily the main expert, but I definitely have some like tips on things. Um, definitely things I wish I knew how to do better with cleaning, but um, so what yeah, anyway. So tips on how to clean that people generally don't know? I, there's a Twitter thread on this thing, Kat. I like, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I there was a Twitter thread, but for our podcast listeners, give them a taste of it. Uh, so I, well, I say that because I feel like I write things down and then like immediately forget them. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's like when I, so I, I usually don't, I don't really use my dishwasher, um, which is kind of weird thing for Texas, but totally normal if you like spend a lot of time in New York City where having a dishwasher is like an extreme luxury. Um, like, I don't know. I like washing my dishes. Um, one thing about it that I do that is like way different than I think most people is like, I don't actually like fill up the sink with water or like have like a thing with like soapy water in it. I just like turn the water on and wash the dishes under the water, um, which probably isn't great for like your water bill all the time. But um, I definitely find it makes it, Hey, 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 Hey. Um, I definitely find that it makes it a lot more enjoyable than having to put my hands in like a big vat of like water. It's just, just like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I clean the same way. So my dishwashing technique, so I do use a dishwasher, but when I wash my hand, it's uh, get the dish wet and sort of get the crud off and then scrub it and then turn on the faucet again and rinse it off. So yeah. I, I don't have the big tub of like, um, you know, water or keep the water Dishwater. running. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think because I grew up with um, water scarcity being sort of a common thing. So mm. 
it's sort of a general norm growing up in India that you don't do things like leave the faucet running while you're washing. You kind of minimize the amount of water you need to get the thing clean. Uh, but Makes sense, oh. yeah. Oh, uh, did I hear a dog bark just now? So You did, yeah. Someone came in and they had to let me know about it. They're great. Dogs are great. Uh, <laughs> uh, alarm bells or whatever you want to call it. They get, they're good at letting you know when there's someone else around. Um, did you hear yeah. my cat? So my cat was meowing a few minutes ago. I muted my microphone. So if you have a cat and a dog featured as guests on the podcast here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That is on our list, right? Cats versus dog, but we should save that for next time where D is for dogs. And right now we can mm, just start yeah, with the opening good. proposition that cats are better than dogs and leave it uncontested till next time. <laughs> right. Definitely how we should do that. That's good. Uh-huh. Well, I think, I think we're running. I think we've hit kind of our time. Was there anything else you wanted to add about... Um, no, I think this we is have more a long list of, uh, yeah, we have a long list of C topics. So we'll have to circle back to C and hit them the next time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we'll say more about coronavirus as it goes on. I guess we'll see, right? Like, uh... It's like coronavirus is so huge that if we are doing this alphabetic order thing, we should find a way to hit it with every single... Uh, letter of the alphabet, right? D for drugs, E for epidemics, F for mm. I don't know, what's his name? Fauci, Fa- the Fauci, Fauci, the guy who yeah who makes the announcements. P for pandemic. So yeah, we, we won't run short of ways to talk about coronavirus with every letter of the alphabet. And, all right, mm-hmm. we know the topic. What about you? Anything else? No, I think that's I think that's everything. Um, We'll say we should wash your hands. Go outside. Oh, mask wearing. Oh, this is one thing that I think that like um, I didn't really latch on to until this week, but um, there's been some rumors on the internet that um, wearing even just a normal surgical mask can do a lot in terms of helping you prevent you from getting sick, which it was really kind of counter to what I had heard early on. Like, it's true that they don't prevent you from getting it 100%, the same that like a high particle filtration mask was, but um, in terms of reducing your exposure, they do help, which I thought was interesting. Um, uh, yeah, that narrative did like a 180, I think, over the course of two weeks. And like, nobody actually believed the first version. It was like, first principles, obvious that it'll be some protection, if not as good as N95, it's still going to be some protection. And yeah. then eventually the news cycle stopped sort of playing us all for fools and uh, uh, got it right. Like the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, I think all of them have stories now saying, oh, the original mask wearing guidance was wrong and you should wear masks. So right. anyway, good thing. So information is a beating noise or signal is beating noise to some extent. That makes sense. It's hard to say. Anyways, we should talk about that at some point. All right, great. Well, Venkat, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for uh, coming on Scorpio season this week. Um, <laughs> uh, great. Uh, and thanks for tuning in. All right. Bye. Next time. See you next time. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.